Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, Ashley and I will bring you stories along with John Russell and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Ashley tells us about a ruling in Australia. Australian Cardinal George Pell was sentenced Wednesday to six years in prison. Pell is a former treasurer at the Vatican. He was found guilty of molesting two boys who belonged to a cathedral choir in the 1990s. The judge said the crime showed staggering arrogance, in other words, a strong sense of power and a shocking lack of feeling for others. Pell and his lawyers say he is innocent and are asking for another trial. But some Roman Catholics in Australia are not waiting until another ruling to form an opinion. The sentencing of Pell marks the end of their religious faith. Jonathan Barrett, a reporter for the Reuters news agency, visited an historically Catholic area in the Australian state of Victoria. The city of Ballarat is home to about 100,000 people. Many settlers from Ireland went to Australia in the 1800s to search for gold. They brought their Catholic faith with them. For generations, children there were baptized as members of the Catholic Church, attended Catholic schools, and raised their own families to be Catholic. But census records from 2016 showed the number of people in Ballarat who say they do not belong to any religion rose sharply. Today, fewer than one in four people who live there say they are Catholic. And even some who said they are Catholic rarely attend church services, Reuters learned. But they still thought of themselves as Catholic until last month, when Australia's top Catholic official was publicly identified as a sex offender. That'll do me. I'm out, said one man while he passed the local church. He did not give his name. Another Ballarat resident, Alan Stevens, spoke more about the issue. He said Pell's case showed the Catholic Church is broken. Stevens, who is 76 years old, was baptized Catholic but is no longer an active member of the Church. He says the reports of abuse have been part of what has made him and others lose interest in being Catholic. Loss of faith in the Catholic Church is not limited to Ballarat. Catholics across Australia are losing their faith. Census records show that in the early 1990s, more than 27% of the Australian population said they were Catholic. Now about 22% say they are Catholic. A Catholic group called the Pastoral Research Office adds that over the years, fewer people have been going to church services. Young people especially have stopped going. However, the U.S.-based Pew Research Center notes that Christianity is increasing in strength in some areas, including parts of Africa and South America. A Catholic clergyman in Ballarat suggests that Catholicism is changing. 
Father Justin Driscoll is an office administrator with St. Patrick's Cathedral. He said strong, centralized religion used to be very powerful in Western countries. Now, he says, churchgoers have more of a voice. Driscoll says he is trying to follow Pope Francis in this way. The Pope has said that high-ranking religious officials should offer generous and humble service and not act as elites who exercise power. The Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race has a new champion. Peter Kaiser won the 1,600-kilometer race early Wednesday. He is from the U.S. state of Alaska. Kaiser is the first person of Yupik descent to win an Iditarod race, notes a statement on the race's website. Yupik refers to a group of native people. Kaiser's team crossed the finish line in Nome, Alaska with a time of 9 days, 12 hours, 39 minutes, and 6 seconds, said a statement on the Iditarod website. Kaiser won the race by about 40 minutes and beat the defending champion, Norwegian Jor Lifeseth Ulsum. Kaiser has competed in the race several times before. He has won other famous dog sled races, including the Kuskokwim 300. The Iditarod is the self-proclaimed last great race on earth. Competitors, called mushers, ride sleds dragged by teams of dogs. The sled teams go over difficult ground and combat freezing temperatures and strong winds. Mushers have different plans for the race. Some lead their teams at night, while others prefer to lead their teams in the day. Mushers have unique training routines for their dogs and feed them special diets. The race's official website notes that the Iditarod is a tribute to Alaska's history and the role the sled dog played. This is what's trending today. Many people know of Pablo Picasso, the Spanish artist who created some of the 20th century's most famous paintings. But few, until recently, have heard of Pigcaso. Pigcaso is the name given to an artistic pig that was rescued from a slaughterhouse in 2016. The pig currently lives and creates art at an animal sanctuary in South Africa's Western Cape region. Joanne Lefson runs the sanctuary. She says pigs are very smart animals that like to keep their minds active. When I brought Pigcaso here to the barn, I thought, how do I keep her entertained, she said. Lefson gave Pig Casso some balls, paintbrushes, and other objects to play with. She basically ate or destroyed everything except these paintbrushes. She loved them so much, Lefson said. Soon, the pig was using those paintbrushes to create art. Her paintings can sell for almost $4,000. The money from her sales go to animal welfare. Pig Casso has even had one of her artworks 
turned into a watch face by Swatch, a Swiss watchmaking company. The limited edition Flying Pig by Miss Pig Casso has green, blue, and pink colors and sells for $120. Flying Pig by Miss Pig Casso has a squealing with joy, notes a statement on the company's Twitter page. Lefson says Pig Casso is definitely an abstract expressionist. The term refers to the artistic movement that sought to communicate emotions using abstract images. You can't exactly define what she's painting, Lefson added, but I can tell you that her style slightly changes depending on her mood, like any great artist. And that's what's trending today. I'm John Russell. Google has launched a new app designed to help blind people explore their surroundings. The free app, called Lookout, is currently available to users in the United States who own a Google Pixel device. The company says it hopes to bring Lookout to more devices and additional countries soon. The app was first announced at Google's I.O. Developer Conference in May 2018. Since then, the company says it has been testing and working to improve the quality of its results. The app uses technology similar to Google Lens. That product uses machine learning to recognize text and objects through a device's camera. Users can then receive information about or take actions related to the text and recognized objects. Lookout builds on this same technology, but aims to provide assistance to people who are blind or have low vision. The app uses a device's camera to recognize text and objects and then provide voice descriptions about what it sees. Lookout is not designed to describe everything, but instead seeks to search out things that people would most likely care about. The app can learn to judge what things are most important to a person over time. Google says the app operates best when the user wears a device around the neck or inside a pocket with the camera lens pointed outward. Lookout has three main settings for people to use. The Explore setting is designed to provide assistance for people carrying out daily activities or for identifying things in new places. A shopping setting can capture products and help users identify their money. The quick read setting can help users go through their mail, read signs, or identify other printed materials. Users can control parts of the app through a fingerprint sensor. For example, the sensor can be used to change operating settings or go through recent results captured by the camera. The app has three different detail levels that can be activated to provide more or less information about objects. Google says the goal of the app is to provide more independence to the nearly 253 million people in the world who are blind or have severe vision difficulties. There are other apps and devices designed to assist these people, too. 
Microsoft's free Seeing AI app works similarly to Google Lookout. Microsoft calls its system, launched for iPhone users in 2017, a talking camera for the blind. Seeing AI can recognize text, objects, and people and speaks results to users. Microsoft says the system can provide audio sounds that relate to current light levels around the user. A recently released version also reportedly lets users put their fingers over a photo of something to get a sense of how the object feels. The app produces small vibrations and sounds to help this process. Another free app called Be My Eyes connects blind or low-sight individuals with sighted volunteers through live video calls. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Soon after the Civil War ended in 1865, thousands of Americans began to move west to settle the land. The great movement of settlers continued for almost 40 years. The great empty west, in time, became fully settled. The discovery of gold had already started a great movement to California. Robert Bostick and Leo Scully tell about the gold rush and the important part cowboys played in settling the West. Men had rushed to the gold fields with hopes of becoming rich. A few found gold. The others found only hard work and high prices. When their money was gone, they gave up the search for gold. But they stayed in California to become farmers or businessmen or laborers. Some never gave up the search for riches. They moved back toward the east, searching for gold and silver in the wild country between California and the Mississippi River. Each new gold rush brought more people from the east. Mining camps quickly grew into towns with stores, hotels, even newspapers. Most of these towns, however, lived only as long as gold was easy to find. Then they began to die. In some of the gold centers, big mining companies bought up all the land from those who first claimed it. These companies brought in mining machines that could dig out the gold from deep underground and separate it from the rock that held it. These companies needed equipment and other supplies. Transportation companies were formed. They carried supplies to the mining camps in huge wagon trains pulled by slow-moving oxen. Roads were built, and in some places, railroads. The great wealth taken from the gold and silver mines was usually invested in other businesses. Shipping, railroads, factories, stores, land companies. More jobs were created in the West, and living conditions got better. More and more people decided to leave the crowded East for a new life in the West. But the big Eastern cities continued to grow. New factories and industrial centers were built, 
people moved from the farms to find work in the cities. The growth of these industrial centers created a big demand for food, especially meat. Chicago quickly became the heart of the meat industry. Railroads brought animals to Chicago where packing companies killed them and prepared the meat for eastern markets. Special railroad cars kept the meat cold so it would remain fresh until sold. As the meat industry grew, the demand for fresh meat increased. More and more cattle were needed. There were millions of cattle in Texas, but no way to get them to the eastern markets. The closest point on the railroad was Sedalia, Missouri, more than 1,000 kilometers away. Some cattlemen believed it might be possible to walk cattle to the railroad, letting them feed on the open grassland along the way. Early in 1866, a group of Texas cattlemen decided to try this. They put together a huge herd of more than 260,000 cattle and set out for Sedalia. There were many problems on that first cattle drive. The country was rough, grass and water, sometimes hard to find. Bandits and Indians followed the herd, trying to steal cattle. Farmers had put up fences in some areas, blocking the way. Most of the great herd was lost along the way, but the cattlemen believed they had proved that cattle could be walked long distances to the railroad. They believed a better way to the railroad could be found with plenty of grass and water. The cattlemen got the Kansas Pacific Railroad to extend its line west to Abilene, Kansas. There was a good trail from Texas to Abilene. Cattlemen began moving their herds up this trail, across the Oklahoma Territory, and into Kansas. At Abilene, the cattle were put on trains and carried to Chicago. In the next four years, more than one and a half million cattle were moved north over the Chisholm Trail to Kansas. Other trails were found as the railroad moved farther west. Trail drives usually began with the spring roundup. Cattlemen would send out cowboys to search the open grasslands for their animals. As the cattle were brought in, the young animals were branded, marked, to show who owned them. Then they were released with their mothers to spend another year in the open country. The other cattle were put together for the long drive to Kansas. Usually they were moved in groups of 2,500 to 5,000 animals. 12 to 20 cowboys took them up the trail. The cowboys worked hard on a trail drive. They had to keep the herd together day and night and protect it from bad men and Indians. They had to keep the cattle from moving too fast or running away. If they moved too fast, they would lose weight and their owner would not get as much money for them. The cowboys would walk the cattle only 20 to 30 kilometers a day. The cattle could feed all night and part of the morning before starting each day. If the grass was good, 
and the herd moved slowly, the cattle would get heavier and bring more money. In the early 1880s, the price of cattle rose to $50 each, and many cattlemen became rich. Business was so good that a $5,000 investment in the cattle industry could make $45,000 in four years. More and more people began raising cattle, and early cattlemen greatly increased the size of their herds. Within a few years, there was not enough grass for all the cattle, especially along the trails. There was so much meat that the price began to fall. There were two severe winters that killed hundreds of thousands of cattle. An extremely dry summer killed the grass, and thousands more died of hunger. The cattle industry itself almost died. Cattlemen also had problems with farmers and sheepmen. Farmers coming west would claim grassland used by the cattle growers. They would put up fences and plow up the land to plant crops. Other settlers brought huge herds of sheep to compete with cattle for the grass, and the sheep always won. Cattle would not eat grass where sheep had eaten. Violence broke out. Cattle growers fought the farmers and sheepmen for control of the land. The cattlemen finally had to settle land of their own, putting up fences and cutting the size of their herds. They no longer could let their cattle run free on public lands. By the late 1800s, the years of the cowboys were ending. But the story of the cowboy and his difficult life would not be forgotten. Even today, the cowboy lives in movies, on television, and in books. When one thinks of the Wild West of America, he does not think of the miners who opened the way to the West. Nor does he think of the men who struggled to build the first railroads across the wild land. And one does not think of the farmers who pushed slowly westward to fence, plow, and plant the land. The words Wild West bring to mind just one character, the cowboy. His difficult fight to protect his cattle on the long trail was an exciting story. It has been told by many writers. Perhaps the best known was a young Easterner, Owen Wister. He worked as a cattleman for several years, then wrote about the heroic life of the cowboy in a book called The Virginian. Another Easterner who came west to learn about the cowboy was the artist Frederick Remington. Remington was a cowboy for only two years, but he spent the rest of his life painting pictures of the West and writing about it. His exciting works made the West and the cowboy come to life for millions who never saw a real cowboy. The cowboy has also lived in music. He had his own kind of songs that told of his problems, his hopes, and his feelings. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.